Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and uh, one of the things we're going to cover today is I'm going to give you an update on this HHS religious exemption thing I did a, a piece on a couple weeks ago because it actually does include something about educational institutions so more details on that but I'm going to start out with a couple of things the first thing is March is PCRM month at Wellness Farm Health um, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is a group I'm associated with, nonprofit in Washington, D.C., started by Neil Barnard. They do amazing things. They operate the Barnard Clinic in um, D.C., which is a, um, a traditional medical clinic, and they have all the dietitians, nurses, doctors, and that sort of thing with a very untraditional approach, which is the use of diet and lifestyle intervention in a medical setting with insurance reimbursement and that sort of thing. So if you're a lucky person and you live in Washington, D.C., you can go to the Barnard Clinic. They also do a lot of research, and I cite their research all the time. Research on diet and pain, diet and diabetes, diet and menopause, diet and migraines, and on and on. So uh, they are right now, PCRM is doing a huge fundraising campaign. Uh, to fund this year's research projects. The goal is $400,000, and we want to do our part at Wellness Farm Health to make this happen. So we're going to uh, donate a portion of uh, membership sales, uh, certification sales, and um, educational programs to PCRM. So if you love PCRM like I love PCRM and, and you want to help out, this would be the month you'd want to sign up for something because they get part of the money. So send me an email at pampopper.msn.com. I'll send you back details and um, let's keep these people doing the stuff they do best. They're really a fantastic group and we want to support them in any way we can. Um, just an update on weight loss. Mary Marshall is the most incredible facilitator in the world. I learn something every time I listen to her speak. I'm so glad I'm not the person facilitating these calls because she's a thousand times better than I am. So if you're struggling with weight and you want to work with somebody who is really from the behavioral standpoint the best of the best of the best, um, email me. I can tell you what the details are and get you enrolled in that. And then um, I got a lot of good feedback on this informed email of the week, like walking people through the decision-making process to try to figure some things out. So here is the email, and then I'll just kind of tell you what my take on it is. My daughter has an eating disorder, which she is getting over and is not actively practicing right now. Her hemoglobin and hematocrit levels are severely low, so she saw a hematologist. Her iron levels were actually normal, so the doctor recommended shots of Procrit to stimulate her bone marrow. What should I do? She's eating a plant-based diet, but she's tired all the time. Well, the first thing is I'll say the usual thing I say. I mean, this is not enough information for anybody to give specific advice, and anybody who would respond with specific advice, I think you would want to question a lot. But, but uh, the first thing is get to the cause. All right, Rarely is the cause of these types of things not taking in enough iron. Common causes are inflammation, lack of absorption, like you're eating enough of it, it's just not getting into the system, and dietary cofactors that might interfere with absorption. People who have a history of eating disorders often have serious health issues even after they stop the behavior, and those health issues sometimes are not addressed, and I can understand that everybody's just so relieved that the person isn't binging and purging or starving that there's um, not a lot of attention sometimes paid to the comorbidities of eating disorders. Um, a careful review of this young lady's medical history, the drugs she's taken, her current eating habits. I might insert here that plant-based eating doesn't always mean healthy eating. People sometimes eat too much fat. And I always say tongue-in-cheek, beer and potato chips are vegan plant-based foods. So we want to make sure that she's really eating a healthy diet. And so that would be part of sorting all this out. So you identify the cause, and then the course of action becomes a lot more obvious from that point. Um, a drug like Procrit may not be needed. The drug stated use, by the way, is to treat anemia in people living with long-term serious kidney disease, kidney failure, people treated for HIV, people receiving chemotherapy for cancer, or anemic patients undergoing surgery with a high risk of blood loss in order to reduce the need for infusions. Now, I don't know if any of this applies to the young lady whose mother wrote to me, but that would be a litmus test for figuring out is this drug the appropriate thing to do. Another reason to avoid treatment by email. Anybody who would comment on this with anything specific would be highly suspect. Um, the side effects. I'm going to just read you a few of these. High blood pressure, headache, joint pain, bone pain, muscle pain or spasms, body aches, nausea, vomiting, trouble swallowing, swelling, fatigue, dizziness, depression, diarrhea, weight loss, sleep problem, problems, pain or irritation, and tenderness where the injection uh, at the injection site, 
blood clots, chest pain, seizures, strokes, heart attack, and death. Now, um, I would say it would be really a good idea to make sure that this is the right treatment for this particular young person. And again, I can't tell. But um, this is the reason why informed decision making is so important because um, my suspicion would be that probably this is not the best uh, way to address this particular person's problems. Um, other things might be more important. So that's what informed decision making is all about. Can't give the answers to the questions here because I don't have the whole story. I can walk you through the types of things that you should be looking at as you try to sort this all out. And uh, one last thing I've been mentioning every week, if you guys are interested in careers, email me, you're doing that. I'm having a lot of great conversations with people about how to do something in the health field that is productive, helps people based on evidence. I can't emphasize the importance of basing everything on evidence. Um, one thing I'll just comment on, people tell me all the time that they're frustrated because they can't get the people to listen to them. I used to not be able to get people to listen to me too. And I think it was because I was out to tell everybody everything. I wanted to do an intervention every time I saw somebody pick up a fork and they were going to put something in their mouth that wasn't so good. It's like I wanted to fly across the room. And I still say there are people in Columbus that if they see me at the shopping mall, they duck into the jewelry store trying not to make eye contact, right? So, so that's part of it. But I think the other part of it is that um, there's too much conversation going on where people are saying, I heard this and I heard that, I read this, I saw this, my doctor, somebody else's doctor, did you see on YouTube? Um, my neighbor says, my neighbor's cousin's girlfriend's great uncle read a book and he says, and nobody can ever sort that out. So the only place you can do this is to just come to the table with evidence and sort it out. That's what we teach here. So if you're interested in learning how to do it, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. Now I have some really happy, happy news for you. I had a good friend in the office yesterday who um, I showed this to because she's been doing the legislative battles like I have been for years, quite effectively, I might add. And uh, so we were talking about um, government overreach and that sort of thing, and I showed her this and she got very, very excited. So you might remember a couple of weeks ago I reported, and the only thing I could do is report that it happened. I really couldn't report much about the actual order, but it was an executive order issued by President Donald Trump which called for the establishment of a new rule by the Health and Human Services Department protecting the rights of healthcare workers to decline participation in any healthcare process or procedure based on their conscience or religious beliefs. Um, so that was the executive order as issued. So HHS published its proposed rules, which now includes specific language concerning vaccines and actually seems to be a little broader than the original order was. And I'm telling you this because I think we really need to flood this website with information and make sure that this, these rules, the ones I'm gonna tell you about right now, um, become effective. So not only are healthcare workers covered, but the requirement to receive vaccinations as a condition of education is also covered under the proposed new rule. Now the, the rules go on for a long time and I've got the link here and I'll tell you how you get it in just a second, but um, the point is I picked out just a few really important things to read to you, but there's more to it. So here's a, an excerpt. Despite the longstanding nature of the federal health care conscience and associated anti-discrimination laws that this rule proposes to enforce, discrimination and coercion continue to occur. To occur. Relevant situations where persons, entities, and healthcare entities with religious beliefs or moral convictions may be coerced or suffer discrimination include being asked to perform, participate in, pay for, counsel, or refer for abortion, sterilization, euthanasia, or other health services, engaging in health professional training that pressures students, residents, fellows, etc., to perform, assist in the performance of, or counsel for abortion, considering a career in obstetrics, family medicine, or elder care when one has religious or moral objection to abortion, sterilization, or euthanasia, raising religious or moral objections to participating in certain services within the scope of one's employment, but here's the big one, being required to administer or receive certain vaccinations derived from aborted fetal tissue as a condition of work or receipt of educational services. That is the most important part. Um, and then it goes on, this was mind blowing to me, it goes on and says it supports the right of patients to seek out doctors and practitioners who share their point of view concerning vaccines with this statement. And it, the headline is patient benefits from conscience pro, uh, protections. 
And again, I'm going to read this to you because I think it's important. In supporting a more diverse medical field, the proposed rule would create, an ancil would create ancillary benefits for patients. The proposed rule would assist patients in seeking counselors and other health care providers who share their deepest held convictions. Some patients will appreciate the ability to speak frankly about their own convictions concerning questions that touch upon life and death and treatment preferences with a doctor best suited to provide such treatment. A pro-life woman may seek a pro-life ob to advise her on decisions relating to her fertility and reproductive choices. A pro-vaccination parent may seek a pediatrician who shares his views. Open communication in the doctor-patient relationship will foster better overall care for patients. So the ability to seek out health care providers, and maybe what will happen is pediatricians can start reporting that they're being harassed because they are a little more relaxed about the vaccination schedule and that sort of thing. Now, I want to be clear about this. This rule doesn't supersede state laws. California, West Virginia, and Mississippi do not allow religious exemptions for vaccines. And it doesn't apply to educational institutions specifically, but there's an interesting thing in the law. It sets up a process whereby people can complain about any organization that receives federal funding and that coerces vaccination or discriminates against those who object. And it specifically addresses the issue of coercion in educational settings, stating, third, Providers of pediatric vaccines funded by federal medical assistance programs must comply with any state laws relating to any religious or other exemptions. So that's a, a pretty big exemption. And so here's the deal. I've got the website here. And what you do is you go to the website and you can um, click on the, the rules. And then there's a place where you can comment. And we want to flood the system with favorable comments. Please, please, please. And, and I want to be clear, this does not eliminate the right to abortion. It just basically says that you can have it, that nobody can be forced to perform an abortion. I think we would all agree somebody shouldn't have to do that. Uh, but the vaccine part of this is very important. And uh, I will say that I think that Donald Trump knew that he could not do something about the vaccine order through the traditional, or the vaccine situation through traditional channels. This one's genius. So let's reward him for doing it, all right? So here's what I'm going to do. My website is drpampopper.com, and I have a blog on that website. I'm going to post this article on that blog. So you go to drpampopper.com, click on the blog, it'll be right there, and then it will show the link. You click through, write wonderful supporting comments about how you want this to be the rule, because you know what's going to happen when other health providers see this, and people who are very entrenched in the pro-vaccine uh, model of things. So um, let's make this stick. All right. That's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.